Yeah, that guy's in trouble. Uh, Anthony, great reporting as always. You can go to lawandcrime.com to learn a little bit more of the top trending stories of the day. And now, after we have covered what else is happening in the country, let's get back to the Christopher Love case. And as I said, I have the verdict for you. Which way did the jury go? Let's first talk about it before we, because, uh, you know, I, we can't really appreciate what the verdict is until we talk about this case. And joining me right now, I have a very special guest, criminal defense attorney, Matthew Mangino. Matthew, great to have you here. Hey, Matthew, can you hear me? I can. Yes, I can. Okay, great. Well, great to have you here. So I just got to ask you, before we reveal what the jury decided, how difficult is it for a jury to come back with a death penalty recommendation, one way or another? Well, it is difficult, but all these jurors are, are death qualified, which means they can uh, listen to the evidence and they have committed to the court that if there is a basis for it, they can, in fact, uh, issue a, a death sentence. Um, the question here is, do the aggravating circumstances in this case outweigh the mitigating circumstances? We heard from um, the victim's family. Uh, we heard about uh, uh, Christopher Love's uh, criminal record. We heard from Christopher Love's family in terms mm -hmm. of mitigation. So the question for this jury is, does, do the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating? And if they find that they do, then they have to impose a death penalty. Well, Matthew, let's find out, because if anybody didn't see, here is the jury's decision from yesterday in the death penalty phase in the Christopher Love trial. And she really is describing just the senseless nature of this tragedy. Just why was she killed? For what? $500 and some drugs? Matthew, isn't that really what makes this such a tragic case, a, a murder for hire plot? And what is a life worth? What was a life worth? Some drugs and some money? Well, certainly that, that testimony is very compelling. And uh, it is a senseless act, uh, you know, to, to murder a vibrant young woman uh, just because uh, you've been hired to do that because of a jealous, uh, spurned uh, former girlfriend. You know, any homicide, any loss of life is certainly a tragedy. But when you when you put all this into context and, and, and you look at Kendra and you look at at what she had to offer and, and the fact that, uh, you know, she was such a vibrant member of the community, donated a lot of her time, uh, did a lot of good work besides, you know, the pediatric pediatric dentistry that she did. And then just to have your life snuffed out because of a failed relationship is is really is really painful, and I'm and I'm sure that resonates uh, with the jurors in this case, who not only determined um, Christopher Love's guilt but also uh, determined his sentence. And it just seems that the jury was not persuaded by the defense's argument that what they seemed to argue was, hey, listen, he was going to be sentenced to, sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That's a, an appropriate punishment for this crime. And there's a lot of people in prison who've done worse crimes, and they haven't been sentenced to death. They didn't, weren't convinced by that argument. No, uh, you know, the, the jury also has to decide issues of, of the propensity for violence, uh, future dangerousness. And certainly when you see someone that with a history of Christopher Love, and the callous and cold-blooded way, you know, he carried out this this murder. Uh, you know, death uh, is the appropriate sentence here, uh, at least as these twelve jurors uh, viewed it. And and you know, if you're going to protect the public, if you're going to hold somebody accountable, uh, then death was the only sentence that they thought was appropriate in this instance. Yeah, and they handed down that sentence for sure. We have a lot more to talk about. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back. A lot more trials and a lot more discussion. Just heart-wrenching testimony bit both sides. And Matthew, that's what's so interesting and tragic about this, is that when you look at it, you just saw two mothers testify. And it's sometimes I think we have to take a step back and realize that this killing affects so many different people, around the, both on the defense side the prosecution, the family members of the victim. I mean, it really affects so many different people. Well, when, when you hear of a homicide, you typically think of the victim as the deceased person, you know, Kendra Hatcher in this case. But there are many victims uh, on both sides of this. Uh, you know, certainly this uh, ridiculous decision 
that Christopher Love made for $500 to snuff out uh, such a beautiful life um, has affected not only uh, Kendra's family, as we have observed from her, her mother, her sister, her boyfriend, uh, friends, but also uh, Christopher Love's family, which is uh, suffering as well. Uh, not only the uh, pain of knowing that their son uh, murdered somebody, uh, but also that uh, now he's on death row and he's heading uh, to a, a, an execution himself. So, so it's very painful in all different aspects of this case. But, but particularly for the victim's family, uh, who, who you know suffered this terrible loss for no good reason. Not that there's ever a good reason to to, to murder somebody, but in this particular instance, it's just really egregious. And Bonnie Jameson, I can't even imagine what it's like for her to sit up there and face the man who killed her daughter, who executed her daughter. Unbelievable. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned here on Long Crime. Well, welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. Now, we apologize. Sometimes live television, you just get these technical difficulties. But thanks for sticking with us. And we're back, and we have a lot to talk about. Let's start back where we, where we last left off, and that was the Zachary Keene case. We expect to be live in that courtroom today. This is the man, again, who's in trial, who's going to be, who's continuing in his trial for first-degree murder and child endangerment. And now I want to play you one clip that you might not have seen. Uh, before we do that, actually, Actually, I want to talk a little bit more about this case with Matthew Mangino. Matthew, sorry about that. Happy to have you back here. Yeah. I want to talk about the Zachary Keene case and the bizarre th situation that we have here. Let's talk about his defense. What we seem to, for him to be arguing is that, you know, he was, he handled the responsibility, he handed over the responsibility to Cheyenne Harris, and she suffered from postpartum depression. Have you ever seen that kind of defense before? I have not. Uh, it's it's interesting. You know, typically postpartum depression is something that a woman woman is going to raise as a defense uh, to some type of uh, abuse or neglect or even homicide. But to have the father of the child raise postpartum depression as a reason why the children weren't cared for because he turned over all responsibility to the mother and the mother was not fit to take care of the children he's therefore not responsible it's an unusual uh defense but but in the case like this uh you know the defense is going to look at every possibility of, of trying to uh save um, mr Keene from an awful fate here yeah that's maybe easier said than done because he was one of the things that we, they established yesterday was that there were other aspects of the house that were very neat and clean. The refrigerator was stocked, cupboards were stocked, but yet little Sterling's room was 81 degrees and he was basically dying in his own filth. I mean, that's just the way to explain it. Now, one of the weird things that we saw was the testimony of Jordan Clark. This is a defendant, this is a, a co-worker of uh, the defendant, Zachary Keene, and the, he's going to talk a little bit about the defendant's drug use, which becomes a big issue in this case. Let's play his testimony right now. Great. Astonishing. It was known that he was using drugs or may have been using drugs. And there's a, the, you know, I want to bring in Matthew Mangino to talk about this, but Matthew, I want you to see the statistic that we have about um, maybe th when these child abuse cases, how maybe you be, be able to prevent it. If we could throw that up right now, I'd like to show it. So uh, this is a child abuse epidemic every year. 3.6 million referrals are made to child protection agencies and 6.6 .6 million children are involved. Uh, Matthew, when you hear this testimony where she said she had, uh, you know, he asked point blank, did you think that he was on drugs? We asked and we thought that he was on drugs. And so this question, what do you think about this? The fact that we always want to know, was there a way to prevent this from happening? Well, well certainly you would hope that, um, you know, some agency, uh, you know, child protective agency, some um, uh, government uh, agency would be able to intervene in situations uh, like this if they're made aware of it. Um, you know, certainly, you know, the drug use in this situation, um, as described uh, by the witness, uh, would be indicative of uh, the possibility of neglect. If you're if you're sleep deprived, if you're uh, paranoid, if you're under the influence for extended periods of time. Uh, when do you care for the child? And I think that goes directly uh, to the issue of neglect right. 
by the defendant in this case. And remember, he is charged with failure to provide critical care. Well, we just got, I'm getting word right now that we are live right now in the King case out of Iowa. So let's go to that live feed in the trial. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about this with Matthew. Matthew, the, again, the idea is, could this have been prevented? You know, what, who knew what about this? And the fact that when Sterling was born, there was the presence of methamphetamine in his umbilical cord, but that test wasn't revealed until after his death. How startling is this? Have you ever heard anything like this before? Well, it is uh, of concern. Uh, certainly, if you find uh, drugs in the system uh, of a newborn, you know, that information, uh, for instance, in Pennsylvania, would be reported to the police because there's the possibility of prosecution uh, of, of the mother just on the very fact that the child has been born, um, you know, with, with drugs in their system or in some instances addicted uh, to drugs at, at birth. Uh, so for this information not to be disclosed, at least uh, to uh, the Children Protective Services, is alarming. Uh, and that's the kind of information uh, that uh, agencies need to make sure that children are not put into jeopardy uh, by parents who use drugs during the pregnancy and most likely are going to continue to use drugs while they're caring for a newborn child. Yeah, and I mean, it's just unfathomable. I really, it's just so difficult to grasp one's mind around what happened to this baby and the idea that blaming it on the mother and saying well it was her responsibility but you were right in the house and do you get the sense from what you've read so far in the case that the, the prosecution is saying that he just didn't like sterling doesn't talk about him didn't want to take care of him but yet there was another two-year-old in the house who was fine yeah you know unfortunately this scenario uh well uh unusual is not you know it doesn't, it happens in other situations for, for reasons that we don't know. You know, some parents take a, a, a liking to a child uh, while they neglect another child in the home. Uh, you know, does it, does it have anything to do with maybe this child was unwanted? Whatever the situation is, it's a terrible scenario, but, but it, it's not completely uncommon. There is, uh, you know, there's a history of this type of conduct by parents, which is really unexplainable. I know. I know it really is unexplainable, and that's what we're trying to do, get some answers here. Uh, Matthew, stand by. We're going to take a quick break, but before we do, I want to let all of our viewers know about a very special promo that we have going on right now. If you go to NBC Universal's Watch Back app and you go to our Law and Crime page, you can look at a lot of different videos, but if you go to check out the Larry Nassar documentary, you can enter to win a prize for watching, and that prize is a signed copy of Lincoln's Last Trial by our very own Dan Abrams. So go to NBC Watch Back app, take a look at our videos, and you might enter into a chance to win that great prize. So check it out. Now, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we will be live in the Keene case. Okay, let's break this down a little bit more with Matthew and Gino. Matthew, how difficult is it for the jury to be sitting through this day in and day out? Well, it is uh, difficult. Um, you have to pay attention. You, you want to make sure that you're listening closely to um, all the testimony that's being presented. But it, it's tedious, and, it, and at times, uh, you know, you know. But th this is the, but the, the details of this case, how graphic, and what we're learning about what this baby Sterling went through. Oh yeah, you know, obviously, you're, you're going to have jurors who have children of their own. You're going to have jurors who have young children. Uh, you know, this is going to be very difficult testimony to listen to uh, with uh, with regard to the, uh, the the way that the child uh, was found, um, you know, the, the history as it leads up to it in, in terms of uh, this child's neglect. Yeah, th this is difficult uh, testimony for jurors to wade through, but they know that they have an obligation to do that. And, and uh, and uh, they have to sit there and, and listen to this. And I have to imagine it was pretty tough getting a jury here, and I think they even had to change counties at one point. Uh, we're going to talk more about that and more about this case and be live in that trial right after this break. Okay, so Matthew, one of the things that we learned from this witness is that she tried to call 911, but the line was busy and uh, she was the one who ran over and actually used officer bolton's um you know radio to call it in so 
uh, that's bizarre. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, certainly in a city the size of uh, Memphis, uh, you know, Shelby County, uh, you would hope that if you made a 911 call that the line wouldn't be busy, especially in such a grave situation as this when an officer uh, is down, has been shot in the street. Uh, yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. We talked a little bit about the jury in the other case. How hard is it to seat a jury in this case when there's a, you know what, we're going to have to hold off on that question because I think we're going back live into the courtroom right now. So stand by, we're going live. Welcome back to Long Crime, everybody. So as you know, we were just covering the Tremaine Wilburn case, but the jury has been asked to step aside for a minute, so there's no feed in that courtroom. We are going to jump back live into the Keene case, except the last witness just left the stand. So I'd like to bring back on criminal defense attorney uh, Matthew Mangino to talk more about these cases. Um, let's talk about Keene for a second. What do you think the defense's best option here? Do you think moving forward, when they're ultimately hands of the case, they should bring on the defendant, they should have him testify if he chooses to? Well, you know, he, he's going to have to, and I think this jury is going to expect, you know, some explanation uh, as to why, uh, you know, their four-month-old child or his four-month-old child uh, basically sat in a swing uh, for seven days uh, after um, after dying and that there's maggots and, you know, this whole scenario. How, how could this happen in, in your household? Uh, how could uh, you have one child who is, is uh, thriving and another child who's basically uh, starved to death and dehydrated sitting in a, in a swing in, in, a, in an offside bedroom? Yeah, what, we're, what we learned from uh, Detective John Turbot, who was just on the stand and he left, uh, they were learning, a, seemed, there was a discussion about what was going on with Cheyenne, what was going on with him, what was the drug abuse, the depression, all really sad issues and tragic issues to try to explain what's happening with this uh, young boy. I'm being told now that we have a live feed into that courtroom, so let's go live and new witnesses on the stand. Okay, so we know what the details of this testimony is going to be. It is going to be very tough to listen to. And I'm back here with Matthew Mangino to talk more about it. You, you know, i not saying I predicted it, but we were just discussing how difficult it might be for the jury to sit here. And I, I have trouble even explaining the facts of the, the state of condition that Baby Sterling was found in. They are about to get a full, in-depth course in that. Is any of this the defense waiting to say, excuse me, this is too prejudicial, uh, this is going to inflame them at some point, or is this just they have to hear the facts of this? Well, they have to hear the facts. Um, you know, if they were going to show, you know, certain uh, photographs that were particularly egregious, you know, that might, uh, you know, draw an objection. But, you know, the, the prosecution has to call uh, the forensic pathologist to provide an opinion as to the cause of death. Uh, and, and that's what, um, you know, this witness is going to methodically do. It's going to lay out exactly, uh, you know, how this child died. And, and it's going to lay that out for the jury so that they understand it, because this is a first degree murder case and you have to present the cause of death. First degree murder, I'm glad you mentioned that. So they are charging this as a way of kind of like felony murder. That's kind of what I've been seeing it as. The fact that the child died, um, this is almost as a, you know, in, as a child endangerment, child neglect case, and the child died as a result. So it, we're going to throw in the, the murder aspect of that. It doesn't quite seem the same kind of premeditated murder, which we see in other cases. But is that the correct way that I'm analyzing it here in this specific case? Because what they continually try to say is, he caused the death of his son. So can you explain that a little bit clearer for our viewers? Well, I think you're, you're, you're right, Jesse. Uh, the Iowa statute says that if you cause the death of a child by extreme indifference to human life, that that falls under specific uh, provision of first degree murder. And in this uh, situation, the extreme indifference to human life is the, is the neglect. Uh, is, is the fact that this child um, was malnourished, was dehydrated, uh, weighed only seven pounds, you know, sat in a, in a, in a, um, in a swing for, for at least seven days uh, without uh, any change of uh, a diaper or anything like that, which caused infection within this child. Uh, so, so that's the aspect 
of the extreme indifference to human life as it relates to the to a child. And that's what makes it a first degree murder charge in Iowa. Yeah. And is this a slam dunk for the prosecution? Is this just an easy case? We say, hey, the baby was in his custody, uh, should have been taken care of. The baby was found dead. The baby's defenseless. Clearly, he's in the wrong. and Clearly, he should be found guilty. Is it a slam dunk case? I don't think it's necessarily a slam dunk case. Obviously, it's a case that, that um, is going to get the attention just because of, of, of the facts and, and the yeah. fact that the victim is a, is a four-month-old child. Uh, but, you know, this idea of first-degree murder uh, for neglect of a child is, is you know, is, is extreme. Uh, you know, so, you know, I'm not sure that the... Uh, that, that the jurors are going to think that this is a slam dunk. And it depends what the defense presents in terms of, um, of this defense of uh, postpartum depression, how all that works out. Uh, you know, even the drug use could be a mitigating yeah. factor in terms of, of how it could, uh, the could, looks. could get a bit messy, but we'll wait to see it. Hey, Matthew, thanks so much for coming on. We can't wait to have you back. We're going Thank to take you. a quick break. We'll be right back right after this.